All right, my name is Stan Hefta. I run the genomics uh, core. I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief update on what we're doing in the genomics core. And then Kevin Shimpaw will come up and talk about the computational core, and then we'll have uh, a, a committee here to, to talk a little. Um, do I? Forward arrow. Forward? Oh, and, oh, this, yeah. Um, okay. So over the last uh, half a dozen years or so, we've seen some major advancements in the field of genomics uh, that have completely revolutionized it. Uh, you've heard some of it today, um, but I can tell you, having made the shift from more of a biochemistry background to uh, a genomics uh, background in the mid-90s uh, when I was with a major pharmaceutical company, um, the, the shifts have really been more pronounced lately. I'm, I can remember back at uh, Bristol-Myers, we would have a, uh, a lab two or three times the size of this auditorium filled with uh, sequencers, and that's all they did was sequence, and we have hundreds of people uh, hired to just maintain those instruments. Now we can do all that on a, a very small subset of instruments. Uh, and really, that has, has really changed the whole dynamics, the price point, and everything else. And it's also brought in the concept that protein sequencing, or excuse me, uh, uh, sequencing of DNA is, is just sort of like the, the instrument itself is like a spectrophotometer. It can be used for a variety of different sources. And our investigators here at Virginia Tech are doing that, uh, applying it in so many different ways. And we're responding to that by adding new instrumentation and new methodologies. And because of that, we're finding even more uptake in the technology and the bioinformatics resources that we have. Uh, this is what uh, one of the big drivers, of course, uh, you've seen this uh, before. And really what it shows is that uh, around the two, 2007 to 8 mark, when really next-gen sequencing really started to take shape and started to really impact how the cost point of sequencing of genomes really plummeted down to now in the sub-$1,000 range. Uh, when I started in this field, it, you could only apply these technologies to very important problems like human biology, human disease. Now we're finding them applied uh, across the board in every life form here at Virginia Tech. And that's just shown here on this slide. These are some of the different departments that we uh, interact with at Virginia Tech. There's actually uh, 21 different departments that use our services, over 100 different research laboratories. Now, those, that's not 100 people, that's research labs across the university that make use. Of course, as you can imagine, the dominant users are in the life sciences, as you can see on the pie chart, but then you get into more and more use coming out of things like biomedical engineering, uh, other areas like that, chemistry, and, uh, and so forth. So we're getting uh, a lot of work from uh, non-traditional users of uh, biological resource centers uh, because they're now finding those applications. Um, everything used to be just on the linear sequence. What is the alphabet of the genome? Uh, some of the work would uh, focus on some other areas, such as where are there histones and so forth and so on. Uh, whole genome analysis was really the craze back a few years ago. Now exome analysis has become more and more. But really, things have changed completely. Uh, this list of new services, new uh, things that can be done by DNA sequencing just continues to expand. And we've expanded our services accordingly. Everything is shifting from the linear sequence analysis 
to functional genomics where people are asking, how does this regulate, how does this gene get regulated, when does it get turned on and off and so forth. So some of our biggest users now are down in the area of uh, the uh, RNA-seq and small RNA discovery and so forth, really at the transcriptional level. Uh, before, as I said, the sequence point or the cost point prohibited you from doing any of this. Now we get samples on the order of a thousand at, at a time uh, that want this kind of a analysis so that they can understand how genes are regulated. Uh, we heard a little bit from David on uh, post-translational modifications, or excuse me, uh, epigenetic modifications such as methyl seq and, and so forth. We do a lot of that. A lot of people are still focused on the express genome. Now, what that has caused in terms of uh, our data informatics uh, area is a complete shift from just doing the quality control cleanups after sequencing to much higher level of analysis. So we provide services that deal with assembly, uh, the expression analysis for RNA-seq and so forth, annotation of genes, discovery of uh, small uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and so forth and so on. And we bring it all the way up through uh, generation of publication quality uh, uh, manuscripts as well as uh, figures and so forth. So it's really a one-stop shop from the initial uh, analysis, experimental design to uh, working through the analysis to producing uh, end products that can be published. Uh, and that's uh, just really shown here again. It, my key points are that our researchers really do demand uh, that we not just focus on linear sequence but go into all these other areas uh, we've responded with that. We have all the new generations of uh, next-gen sequencing, all of the bioinformatics suites that you need to do the analysis. And because of that, we're enabling research across the campus. And here are just uh, some of the folks that are in the lab. You heard from Alan, Chris, uh, Megan, your Sai, and Jenny, and Ruhi, and Bob. And Sai. Cariella, Bob Setledge will come up as part of the, the uh, panel discussion to answer more specifics. Now I'll turn it over to um, Kevin uh, to talk a little bit. Okay, so I'm Kevin Shinbaum, I'm the uh, director of IT here at BBI. And, oops, we went the wrong way there. Um, so if you, you've kind of seen my co a common theme from this morning. We've seen that. Uh, there's a lot of laboratories that are generating data, and as we look for, you know, in the past it used to be a very small amount of data, but that data load is now increasing. And so this is a report for the Department of Energy. So they said that uh, data intensive and compute intensive um, applications are the key components for driving science in the 21st century. And so they kind of came up with this idea that our traditional tr uh, pillars of science were experimentation and theory. And then in the 2000s, we started seeing that doing uh, simulations, large-scale computer simulations, were also another key component of science. So there you could probably look at, um, in the astronomy field, you know, you could do a virtual laboratory. So we can't study how stars are formed or how um, galaxies are formed, but you can do that sort of modeling and simulation on a computer. Same thing with proteins. Looking at how they fold, you can probably see the beginning state and the end state and when you're trying to instrument this stuff and going in, in the process, you may not be able to catch that information, but you can do that sort of modeling on the computer. Um, now we're beginning to see that we're coming in the big, kind of this, uh, a lot of people say big data, but it's really data intensive. So it's using data that's, in, that's all around us, so this could be healthcare data. Maybe we were looking at healthcare data and trying to figure out what correlations are there for people with a, a certain genetic sequence that might have some risks of cancers, et cetera. Carla kind of uh, touched on this a little bit this morning. So we have data generation. This can be from laboratories. 
This could be from Twitter feeds. So in the case of maybe NDSSL, they may be taking Twitter feeds looking at if people are saying, oh, I have the flu. And so then they might be able to have some geographic information about that person. They can th then throw that data into their model. They can say that now, okay, Bob Smith in Flagstaff, Arizona has the flu, and maybe we, we know enough of information about this population set that now we can do a simulation on a large computer. So if we go through this, we have um, you know, data generation, then you have to process that data. Um, so you're either capturing that data, um, trying to go through the data and figure out what key points you want, and then doing some mining and discovery. So Carla had also in their predictions and then also validations. So in the case of NDSSL, they're looking at trying to influence policy. So we could be looking at, um, again, we mentioned the flu. They could look at different ways of doing vaccinations or maybe uh, uh, quarantines that might help prevent the spread. Um, so the key component here at VBI for doing some of this research is shadow facts. Uh, currently, it's about 4,000 uh, compute cores, or actually 3,300 compute cores, and about 14 terabytes of memory. And this has grown organically over time. So we started this about, um, about four years ago, and so various groups have now contributed to the uh, system itself, and so we've gotten it to grow up into this size here. And really, it's a hybrid compute model. So there's uh, nodes with different sets of memory, different sets of processors. Some of them have FPGAs in them. Some of them have uh, GPUs in them. We also have some large memory nodes. So in the case of doing genomics analysis, uh, sometimes the large memory nodes are really a key critical component to do that research. Um, we also have to have database systems and also data storage. So in the case of um, uh, Skip's work, they have a lot of the genome uh, data from NIH, so the 10,000 Genome Project as well. And so they're able to mine that data to look for maybe uh, cancer markers or et cetera. In the case of NDSSL, they have databases that has all the uh, census data, um, also the road infrastructure and other infrastructure as well, like cell, cell towers, et cetera. So, one of the things we've been trying to do is uh, grow the system. So working with you all, uh, the researchers, um, we'd like to work with you in identifying what sort of resources do you need and then trying to help you with getting funding. Uh, in one case, we went with uh, NDSSL through a DOD program called DURP, which is Defense University Research Instrumentation Program, and we ended up with a grant of about $300,000 to expand ShadowFax. Um, also, we've been working with um, Central IT, and they're put in a proposal recently into uh, the campus network infrastructure uh, grant through NISF. And the key here is if, they, if this does come through, hopefully it's going to increase the availability of networks, high-speed networks, to various departments on campus so that we can move data into and out of our facilities. So if you look at, in the labs here, we're generating a lot of genomic data. So somebody else may want that data somewhere at their center, so we have to transfer it out. But there might be cases where we want to pull data in from other locations as well. So future plans. So one of the things that we see coming in the future is that we have to have a way of tracking all this metadata. And also for you guys, um, you have some data that you know you're going to eventually publish a paper on. Well, at some point you might want to have that data available for other people to use. So if we can tag that data, as you move that data around the system, you don't have to worry about which <laughs> folder I put it in. You just have it tagged with the correct information. We can keep track of it, and then the system can, you know, if somebody says, I need to look up so-and-so's paper, they can put that information into the keyword search and pull it up, and the data's there. Um, this week, we've had a group from Dell and uh, Total Site Solutions looking at uh, renovating a facility here at VBI. Currently, ShadowFax has kind of reached the limit of our data center. So we've run out of cooling in that data center upstairs. Um, so we're now looking at potentially expanding into a 27, uh, 2,600 square feet on the bottom floor of the building and adding more power, more cooling, so we can continue growing the computational infrastructure here at VBI. Um, 
We have uh, some new systems coming in that are going to add to Shadowfax in the next few months. So we're getting about uh, 34 nodes. Um, it's going to add about 8,000 more, I mean, 800 more cores and about 4.3 more terabytes. And also we have some new very large shared memory systems that are coming in. They're going to have about 60 cores each and 3 terabytes of memory. So here's kind of the services that the uh, IT staff provide. So we have a help desk team, a system engineering team, database support, and also a software development team. And here's the various groups here. So we want to work with you. We want to work with trying to figure out how we can build the infrastructure you guys need to get your research done. So thank you, and I think we're going to do our uh, panel now. Great. Well, we have time for uh, several questions this morning. The only question you cannot ask is Sai Kumar directly when your sequencing run will be finished because I think he gets caught. <laughs> For Kevin, maybe this is too personal, but I'd be really interested in learning how, as a bioinformatician, I could actually get the NVIDIA GPU cores working on, say, a sequence alignment to the genome kind of a problem, or the kind of things that I do a lot that it seems like there's, un there's resources there that I haven't learned to tap, and do you have, like, workshops, maybe, that people here could learn from? Actually. Uh, at some point, we'd like to set up workshops um, on the NVIDIA question. Uh, NVIDIA has been developing, um, porting various uh, bioinformatics tools onto those uh, platforms. Uh, the current NVIDIA platforms that we have are, are K20. We haven't seen too many people utilize them that yet. And the key issue there, I think, a lot of times is if you look at the memory on board these uh, accelerator cards, they're pretty small. And so if, the, if you're trying to process a large amount of data or your genome sequence or whatever you're trying to do is larger than what will fit in memory there, you're better off using a standard CPU-based system. So, but there are some cases where it's probably going to be beneficial. And it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Okay, so I got another question for the computational core. It seems like, you know, uh, Shadowfax has grown tremendously over the years in size and scope. So how do you guys really network all of these things to work together? And is there going to be a ceiling eventually with the technology or? Well, we've kind of hit one ceiling already, which we're out of cooling in the <laughs> data center. So <laughs> um, in the new data center, we hope to have it so that we can actually go to um, probably an or, uh, at least 10 to 20 times our current capability. And then over time, we hope to even grow, uh, as, as technology grows forward, we'll hope to grow that even higher. Um, so on the networking side, so we're doing this as a hybrid. It's really, in some cases, it's uh, multiple systems that are tied together through inventive band networks and also through the queuing system. Everything sits on top of the same file system. So that means that if you're wanting to do, um, sometimes we have some workflows that maybe initially you need to have large shared memory, so you bring it into the system, do some initial processing with large shared memory, and then at some point maybe you need to go into a distributed sort of computation. So having a common file system allows you guys to move your data around. Well, actually, you don't have to move your data around, you just have to kick off the various jobs at the right point to do your analysis. And you have to have people. 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 Okay. That, I, that's the hardest part is uh, finding people that know that technology. It's a subset of information technology, so you really need smart people, and when you find them, you hold on to them and <laughs> throw money at them. <laughs> that's um, the answer to all of life. No, we're sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I got one final question for the DAC, if anyone else also would like to ask. This is a good time. Um, it seems like we've kind of standardized into this Illumina Seq model because uh, it's being utilized so much these days. But, you know, ion torrent technology and this mini proton also um, have really started taking off. So how does the DAC, I guess, prepare itself to deal with all these different data sets? Or is it something you can stream into an existing pipeline? Those are good questions. Um, I, you know, the easy answer or the is really I, I do a lot of reading, and I think Alan does too. So we, we do a lot of, um, 
we, we do a lot of sort of research on our own um, to, to, to maintain sort of our state of, our, our own current state of the art. Um, specifically for the ion um, proton and ion torrent, we've already been looking at data from those. So uh, about two years ago, we started looking at, at, at data um, from, a, from a client that has their own proton. So we're, we're not new to that. Um, we, we haven't looked at any of the, like, nanopore or anything like that, so I, you know, I, don't, I can't answer any questions like that. But really, you know, we, we spend a lot of time combing their literature um, just to, to really maintain our own currency. I'd like to ask a question of uh, some of the f future directions that uh, uh, Sci sees uh, coming out of, uh, uh, from the technology point of view, and where are the applications that you see for Virginia Tech uh, moving forward? So, just wanted to let you know, uh, see, one of the common themes in all the projects that people have provided is the GRL. You know, so we have done a lot of work for a lot of folks that have presented today, uh, a lot of sequencing. And we are not just a sequencing facility. We, off, we it's a one stop from, you know, from all of it, from, from the beginning, like experimental design. If you don't design your experiment well, uh, it's junk in and junk out. So, uh, so, and one of the areas that we are expanding into is this epigenetics. So, uh, you know, David also already presented some very good data. We had done the sequencing for David. Uh, we, are, we have also done projects for in the, in the plant pathology where people are looking at the effects of herbicides uh, on DNA methylation. So the other area that has just blossomed is the meta metagenomics and the microbiome projects. So, you know, the, there are various labs that are looking at, you know, what are the so, uh, organisms that are living in the, uh, in, in, the, in the root zone or uh, what, when you treat somebody with probiotics, uh, what are the microbiomes that show up? So, and people want to find out, there was another project that we were recently involved in is going to get involved is in the Pantagonia and the Chile. They want to identify uh, what are the antibiotic activity that, that's in there, or what are the antiviral activities in there. So those are those are two fields that are really blossoming, and we hope that you know and uh, and GRL has optimized all the protocols for all that. So so we're very excited to offer those services to uh, people at VT. Okay, great. Well, why don't we take time to thank the panelists once again? Thank you.